so in the minutes I have uh, from Maria to, to talk to you today, I will tell you a little bit about my path, which is kind of a long one, might, might actually be the longest one in the room, not really sure, but uh, uh, I was first affected with uh, uh, LHON, uh, and I didn't know what it was uh, when I was 16 years old, that was in 1972, and I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, wait a second, how old is this dude? <laughs> I'm, gonna help you with, I'm gonna help you with the math. Take 2017 minus 1972, add 16, double it up, triple, triple it up, add three, I'm six, <coughs> 61 years old. So I've ha had <clears throat> eyesight issues uh, for about 45 years. Um, what I'd like to do in my talk, there are a lot of people here, I think young and old, uh, who are recently affected, and that includes James and Richie here on the panel, um, and Maria as well, just a few years ago. Um, so hopefully I can uh, give some positive comments uh, to people, especially the younger people who are, who are newly affected. So you might want to write this down. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is till the end of my, my few minutes here, but the word is I missed, I-M-I-S-T. Don't start Googling it, you're not going to find it. It's not an Apple product, it's not an iPhone, an iPad, it's nothing like that. And I'll tell you what it is at the end. Part of it is I want you to pay attention while I'm talking. And if I get boring, <laughs> you'll still hang on to hear what I miss stands for at the end. Uh, so back in 1972, um, my, my sister, who was registered to come uh, to this conference, um, uh, but she had a death in the family, but she and I had just gotten, I was 16 years old, gotten uh, learner's permits. And our parents had a cool convertible, so we would go out driving together with learning permits, which of course is not exactly legal. Uh, but we decided if the cops ever pulled us over, we would just, um, with a straight face, say that we thought two learner's permits added up to a regular license. <laughs> uh, we, we never got pulled over. But about two months after I got that driver's license, I had a new job at a local um, uh, new Olympic swimming pool that had opened up. I got a great job there after school and weekends. Uh, and over the course of Labor Day weekend, I lost my vision. I was reading a book. Uh, on Friday night when I started the job for the first time and by Sunday I couldn't read the book. Um, so mentioned it to my parents, went to, to our ophthalmologist. I had worn glasses as, as a child, so already had an ophthalmologist. Um, Dr. Newman mentioned a bunch of the kinds of tests. Uh, many of you, it's a familiar story. Lumbar punctures, spinal tap, uh, fluorescein angiograms with that dye they put in your arm. Mm -hmm. Um, all kinds of things, and eventually I had treatments, uh, including different medications, prednisone, cortisone, shots in the eyes, I wasn't gonna mention that, but Dr. Newman already opened that door. Uh, Non-steroidal medications in forms of eye drops, that sort of thing. Uh, so all kinds of treatments. Um, it was seen by numerous doctors, including a, a doctor named Dr. Wise in Montefiore Hospital in Yonkers, New York. Um, and the conclusion was from, from a group of maybe five different doctors, we think you have this thing called Lieber's. They called it Lieber's back then. They didn't call it LHON, Lieber's disease. And I thought, a disease? I have a disease. Uh, that, that didn't ring well. There were two things from my high school uh, time that, that really stand out for me. One was we kind of had a family meeting. I have two sisters, um, my mom and dad. And my mother, I really uh, credit her in many ways. Um, she said, okay, okay, we're not going to call this a disease. We're not going to call it an impairment. We're not going to call it uh, a disability. We're going to call it um, a condition, a neutral word. A condition was what she came up with. And that was a good and bad thing because I did have some vision. I had mobility. Um, I continued with high school. Back then, there wasn't much in the way of technology. It, it, it consisted of a magnifying glass and some tape recorders. My parents, my sisters, read into tape recorders, read to me each evening my homework. Uh, and um, the other thing that stands out for me, and this is important, especially for the younger people, um, the other thing that stands out in my high school experience was you learn that some people may not be, who you thought may not be so willing to help you, but more importantly, there are people out there you don't even know who will come to the forefront to assist you with all kinds of things. So that was a great experience. And um, when I got towards the end of high school, my dad said to me, what are you thinking about for university? And at that point, I really hadn't, I thought, how am I gonna do that? I, you know, I'm getting out of high school, I had some pretty good marks, a lot of people helping me, but how on earth am I gonna go to university?
but he planted that seed and I did go to university. I had uh, continuing with readers. I had one lady who I, I have no idea how she called me one day. She was a nun at a local convent. She said, I will read for you. She said, I have a master's degree. And I'd love to read the material. So I graduated in business administration a few years later. But in my, in my third year there, my father said to me, what are you thinking about for graduate school? And I had <laughs> not thought about graduate school at all. Uh, but again, that seed got, you see the theme here, and uh, the seed was planted. So I applied to, uh, to law school um, for, for a few different places. I was interviewed at a number of different law schools because I think they didn't know how they would deal with someone. I wasn't the first one to, to do that, but um, I w maybe one of the early ones. But I pictured this mountain of books, maybe four feet high, that I would have to get through during the course of three years of law school. Um, a new service had started up at another university. It was a vol uh, volunteer service. Uh, I bought, basically bought two sets of books throughout law school, and uh, the reading service basically read everything into a tape recorder. Um, the best thing about law school was that's where I met my wife, Mary. Uh, we graduated um, um, and in the same year. Uh, we were married a, a year or two later, um, and then, as I mentioned, my, my two children are here as well. Mary continued in the practice of law. I did um, become a member of the bar in Ontario, but very rapidly figured out it really wasn't gonna be for me. It would be a very difficult <coughs> lifestyle during the day. So I thought, okay, I have an undergraduate business degree. I have a, a law degree. W how can I combine these things? Um, I ended up in the investment profession, which, is, which has worked out well. Um, but remember, go back to 1972. I still don't know that I ha actually have Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Along comes 1993, I have two little children, we're living in uh, uh, Mississauga, just outside Toronto, and I get a call from one of the genetics clinics at the Hospital for Sick Children, and they said, there's a test now, it's done at the Emory Clinic in Atlanta, and we can, we can actually determine if this thing we think you've had all these years is, is actually what you have. So a blood sample was sent away, and then in 1993, it came back with the 14484 uh, diagnosis, which, which was interesting, nothing to be done, of course, but at least uh, some knowledge and uh, starting to, uh, to maybe understand the disease a little bit more. I had never met anybody with LHON other than two cousins I have, one uh, with onset at age 40, a male cousin, and one at onset at age 50, like Maria, a female cousin. Um, but until... Uh, figuring out LHON.org a couple of years ago and coming to this event, participating in the calls, I never met anybody with it. So this has been a whole new chapter for me. Um, but uh, moving on from the diagnosis in 1993, uh, again, not much to be done. The diagnosis was done again by the Emory Clinic. Ironically, we moved to Atlanta a couple of years later <laughs> and, we, and we lived there for, for about 15 years. We moved to Connecticut about seven years ago. So, uh, so that was my path. Um, I think what I'd like to, um, to encourage, especially the younger people, but the older, older people in the, in the group here who have recent onset, there are possibilities. And I think Billy in the last presentation used the word uh, doing things a different way. There's always a way to get something done. It's going to be different for you than maybe the way you did it before. And, and realistically, obviously, if you wanted to be an astronaut, that may not happen for you. But, um, <laughs> but you, really, you really should think that you can accomplish most of the things that you, you thought you could before you had onset of LHON. Um, so I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts as you, as you uh, learn to live with your, your situation. Um, it's very important for you to be flexible. That's true for most people, but particularly in a situation where you really can't see a whole lot, it's important to be flexible because things that you think you're going to encounter may be quite different for you, and you need to be able to roll with the punches, let's put it that way. So if you're a person who likes everything to be orderly, you may want to try to modify <laughs> that, that thinking because you're going you're gonna to get a lot of surprises in life. Um, there are lots of people out there who are willing to help you. So two things about that. You need to ask. Don't be, don't be um, bashful about it. That theme, I think, has come out a couple of times today. Uh, people will be willing to help. And you can create little teams of people that help you in school, in work, in your home, in your family, all kinds of things like that. Uh, create little teams, and you can help them, and they can help you. 
Um, let's come back to that word, I missed. What the heck is that? Hopefully everyone's still awake. <laughs> if you take I-M-I-S-T and put it in the middle, middle of the word optic, as in Labor's her hereditary optic neuropathy, you get the word optimistic. That's a key word for you to remember. Try to be optimistic. It's difficult at times. Um, the last thing I want to tell you uh, when you're asking for help and as you go through school, work, life, um, facial recognition is a problem for all of us. Um, we want to be friendly. It's hard for us to recognize people. It's hard for us to make that eye contact uh, with people. What I've come to the conclusion is walk around with a smile on your face. You'll be a lot more <laughs> approachable. And when you ask for help, people are, are going to uh, um, be much more willing to respond to you. So that's the key thing, I think, is go through life smiling. And uh, it'll help you a lot as you ask people to help you. So I'm going to ask James to, uh, to continue and pass the mic.